This is Dr. Mitch Robinson and this video is on the TCA cycle and it accompanies handout number six for cellular and molecular medicine. In this video we'll describe the TCA cycle and we'll see how the reactions in this cycle function in energy production and their role in some metabolic disorders. So let's begin by looking at this table from page two of your handout which just shows that you get much more energy from glucose by converting it to carbon dioxide aerobically than you get anaerobically by converting glucose to lactate. The figure on the bottom of the page shows that the TCA cycle has two stages of, anaero of aerobic energy production. The first is the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. This is sometimes considered separate from the TCA cycle, and this is known as the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex reaction. The second stage is the TCA cycle itself, where acetyl-CoA is converted to two molecules of CO2. The most important part of this process is the production of electrons. This will be in the form of reduced carrier molecules, NADH and FADH2. These electrons will be used to make ATP, and we'll look at this process in the next handout and video. These electrons will eventually be combined with oxygen to make water. Let's look at this again in our big picture of metabolism. Here we have the TCA cycle, and as we've seen, carbohydrates enter through glycolysis. Fatty acids are broken down in the mitochondria and enter as acetyl-CoA. Dr. Rusinol will talk about that process later. Amino acids can be catabolized to various molecules which enter the cycle at different points. Dr. Johnson will talk about that later. Okay, now we've converted glucose to two molecules of pyruvate and if there's oxygen as available, this will be moved into the mitochondria. Let's take a minute and examine the structure of the mitochondria. This is a video from Harvard BioVisions, and it shows a mitochondria moving around in the cell, guided by microtubules. And this illustration looks at the double membrane structure of the mitochondria. The outer membrane has channels made of the protein porin, and these allow any molecules smaller than 5,000 molecular weight to pass through freely. So the outer mitochondrial membrane is fairly permeable to small molecules. So the concentration of small molecules such as ions and sugar in the inner membrane space is pretty much the same as the cytosol. The inner membrane is the location of the electron transport chain and the machinery for making ATP. The inner membrane has a very high protein to phospholipid ratio, and it's highly impermeable to most all molecules. Most of the enzymes of the TCA cycle are in the matrix. Almost all ions and molecules require special membrane transporters to enter the matrix, and this includes pyruvate, which enters the, passes through the outer mitochondrial membrane and then through a special transporter into the matrix. So now that we have pyruvate in the mitochondrial matrix, we can see how it's converted to acetyl-CoA by the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction. The PDH reaction is the first committed step in aerobic metabolism, and it serves as a gateway for the entrance of all carbohydrates to aerobic metabolism. The reaction is carried out by a multi-enzyme complex that's composed of three different enzymes and involves five coenzymes that are listed on page four. The enzymes are pyruvate dehydrogenase, sometimes known as pyruvate decarboxylase, dihydrolipoyl transacetylase, and dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase. There are five coenzymes, coenzyme A, NAD, FAD, thiamine pyrophosphate, and one that we've not seen before, lipoic acid. The structure of lipoic acid is shown on the bottom of page four. We can synthesize this molecule so there's no vitamin requirement. The PDH reaction is actually carried out by a large organized multi-enzyme complex that has multiple copies of each of these en three enzymes and many copies of the cofactors. The illustration at the bottom of the page shows the reactions involved in the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. It's worth looking at this to see how the coenzymes work in this process, but you do not need to know these reactions. The first enzyme catalyzes the decarboxylation of pyruvate. 
in which a hydroxyethyl group becomes bound to thiamine pyrophosphate. Thiamine pyrophosphate is covalently attached to the first enzyme. This hydroxyethyl group gets transferred to coenzyme A, and the product is acetyl-CoA. The hydrogens extracted in this reaction are transferred to lipoic acid, which is part of the second enzyme. The hydrogens are then passed from lipoic acid to FAD to make FADH2, and they're passed on to NAD to make NADH. So the final products of the reaction are carbon dioxide, reduced NADH, and acetyl-CoA. The enzyme complex is regulated by phosphorylation dephosphorylation. There's another enzyme associated with this complex, pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase. This is a regulatory enzyme. It's a kinase in that it puts a phosphate group on proteins, and this one attaches a phosphate from ATP to one of the PDH enzymes, and this inhibits the reaction. The enzyme's activated allosterically by ATP, acetyl-CoA, and reduced NADH. So when the energy levels in the cell, cell are high, you have lots of ATP, and the products of the reaction, acetyl-CoA and NADH, build up and they inhibit the enzyme by allosterically activating PDH kinase. The brain and neural tissue are particularly susceptible to any condition that inhibits energy generation from carbohydrates. This is because carbohydrates are the main source of fuel for these tissues. Fatty acids and amino acids can be used to generate ATP in other tissues, but the brain depends almost exclusively on glucose for energy production. So anything that interferes with the PDH reaction will result in neurologic symptoms. It will also result in an increase of pyruvate and lactate in the blood. Lactic acidosis can occur due to accumulation of lactate. So let's examine three different conditions that involve dysfunction of the PDH reaction. Thiamine is a coenzyme that's required in the first step of the reaction, and thiamine deficiency results in reduced conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. The symptoms of beriberi and Wernicke syndrome include neurologic disorders, muscle weakness, and increased blood pyruvate levels. Arsenic crosslinks and binds irreversibly to sulfhydryl groups including those on lipoamide, which is a component of the second enzyme in the PDH reaction. Ingestion of arsenates results in inactivation of the PDF, PDH reaction. Arsenic also binds sulfhydryls of collagen and hair, and it can be detected in these tissues. There are many genetic diseases associated with deficiencies of enzymes in the PDH complex. The most common are due to the first inhibition of the first enzyme in the pathway. The main pathologic result of mutations of the PDH enzymes is cerebral lactic acidosis, encephalopathies, ataxia, and retardation. Again, the prevalence of neurologic symptoms is because the brain obtains most all of its energy from the aerobic oxidation of glucose. So now the product acetyl-CoA can be completely metabolized to carbon dioxide through the reactions of the tricarboxylic acid, or TCA cycle. It's also known as the citric acid cycle, or Krebs cycle. This pathway performs other functions in the cell in addition to oxidation of fuel molecules. The intermediates in the TCA cycle are all important building blocks for other molecules. Now most of you are probably familiar with the TCA cycle. It's not necessary to memorize all the enzymes and intermediates in this pathway, but we do need to look at the process and point out a few important features. The TCA cycle begins with the condensation of the two carbons of acetyl-CoA with a molecule of oxaloacetate. The product is citrate. The enzyme citrate synthase is the pacemaker of the TCA cycle. Aconitase results in the formation of isocitrate. This essentially moves the hydroxyl on the molecule. 
This molecule now has three carboxyl groups, hence it's a tricarboxylic acid. The next step is the isocitrate dehydrogenase reaction. And this is an oxidative decarboxylation, just like in the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction. A carboxyl group is removed to form carbon dioxide. And this is a highly energetic process. It accompanies the removal of two hydrogens, which are transferred to NAD to form NADH. This is followed by the alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase reaction. And this catalyzes another oxidative decarboxylation. This reaction is very similar to pyruvate dehydrogenase. It uses the same sort of multi-enzyme complex and the same coenzymes. The product is succinyl-CoA. And this is converted to succinate in the next step, succinyl-CoA synthase. The hydrolysis of the thioester is energetic and drives the reaction. This reaction is coupled to the formation of a molecule of GTP from GDP and phosphate. This is a substrate level phosphorylation, similar to the reactions we've seen where ATP is formed in glycolysis. But here we're forming a high energy bond and it's a guanine nucleotide GTP rather than ATP. This is an enzyme, nucleoside, there is an enzyme, nucleoside diphosphate kinase, that can use the GTP to form ATP. So the net product uh, is the production of ATP from ADP and phosphate. Succinate is converted to fumarate by succinate dehydrogenase. And these hydrogens are transferred to FAD to make FADH2. Fumarate is then converted to malate, and then malate is oxidized to oxaloacetate. So oxaloacetate used in the reaction is regenerated at the end of the cycle. The net reaction is shown on page 8. The conversion of acetyl-CoA to two molecules of carbon dioxide and coenzyme A results in the generation of three molecules of reduced NADH, one reduced FADH2, and a GTP, or ATP, is formed. The TCA cycle is an amphibolic pathway, meaning that it serves both anabolic and catabolic processes. So in addition to the catabolic breakdown of acetyl-CoA to carbon dioxide to produce energy, it also produces intermediates that are used as precursors for the biosynthesis of complex organic molecules. Let's look at four different anabolic reactions of the TCA cycle. First, acetyl-CoA is a precursor for lipid biosynthesis. The two carbons of acetyl-CoA are used to make fatty acids and steroid molecules, including cholesterol. Now, acetyl-CoA itself cannot pass through the inner mitochondrial membrane but citrate can be exported through a particular transporter molecule. And once in the cytosol, it can be converted to acetyl-CoA by the enzyme ATP citrate lyase. Next, TCA cycle intermediates can be used to make glucose through gluconeogenesis, which we'll talk about next week. Malate and oxaloacetate can be used, but actually any of the intermediates in the cycle will eventually form malate and oxaloacetate, and they can be exported and used to make glucose. Third, TCA cycle intermediates can be converted to amino acids through transamination reactions. Alpha-ketoglutarate can be converted to glutamate. Oxaloacetate can be converted to aspartate. Dr. Johnson will talk more about this later. Finally, succinyl-CoA can be used to make the heme group for the synthesis of porphyrins that are important in building hemoglobin. As I mentioned, oxaloacetate is required for the metabolism of acetyl-CoA to carbon dioxide. Oxaloacetate is used in the citrate synthase reaction, but as long as it's regenerated at the end of the cycle, there's no need for continued input. However, as we've just seen, intermediates of the TCA cycle are used for biosynthetic reactions. And when this happens, oxaloacetate is not regenerated. 
So we need a mechanism to replenish oxaloacetate for the citrate synthase reaction. Reactions that can be used to replenish the supply of oxaloacetate are called anaplerotic reactions. There are two ways to generate TCA cycle intermediates that can form oxaloacetate. First, it can be synthesized from pyruvate through the pyruvate carboxylase reaction. In this reaction, ATP is required to supply the energy needed for addition of a carboxyl group from carbon dioxide, shown here as a bicarbonate ion. The reaction requires the vitamin biotin, which is necessary for carboxylation reactions. Pyruvate carboxylase is allosterically activated by acetyl-CoA. So if there's a short supply of oxaloacetate, the citrate synthase reaction slows down and acetyl-CoA accumulates. The acetyl-CoA stimulates the production of oxaloacetate for the reaction. The second mechanism to supply TCA cycle intermediates is through deamination of amino acids. We mentioned that alpha-ketoglutarate and oxaloacetate can be used to make amino acids through transamination and these reactions are reversible. The amino acids can be deaminated by the same enzymes to form TCA cycle intermediates, and these can be converted to oxaloacetate. Let's look at the regulation of the TCA cycle. The pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is the first control point in the cycle, and this step regulates the generation of acetyl-CoA from carbohydrates. We've already seen how the PDH complex is regulated by phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. Remember that the phosphorylation inhibits the PDH reaction. So what, a what activates PDH kinase inhibits pyruvate dehydrogenase. So these activators of PDH kinase inhibit pyruvate dehydrogenase, and the inhibitors of PDH kinase activate pyruvate dehydrogenase. Citrate synthase is a major control point. When the intermediates of the TCA cycle, succinyl-CoA and citrate, accumulate, they feed back and inhibit the enzyme. ATP and reduced NADH signal that energy reserves are high and inhibit citrate synthase. Probably the most important factor in the regulation of the TCA cycle is the ratio of reduced and oxidized NAD. As we'll see in the next section, the electrons from NADH and FADH2 are used to make ATP through oxidative phosphorylation. So when ATP is being consumed, NADH levels decline and oxidized NAD accumulates. Oxidized NAD activates the dehydrogenase reactions. This includes the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction, alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, isocitrate dehydrogenase, and malate dehydrogenase. This results in the generation of more NADH for ATP production. And that completes our video on the TCA cycle.